and welcome back to my channel uh, so I'm just going to ca carry on from where I left off last time um, on your politics and your diversity movement and I'll see if I can get onto some of your comments so in the last video I just got up to a bit where I was mentioning how drier um, no it's drier is just an academic <laughs> drier notes and rejects arguments for defining neurodiversity, for defining neurodivergent, I should say, to include those conditions that emerge naturally, that are associated with contributions to society, that are congenital as opposed to acquired, and that prompt self-identification with the movement's rejection of cure. So he, um, but he rejects those arguments for defining neurodivergent in that way. Debates on the appropriateness of applying neurodiversity ideas, in particular the rejection of cure and prevention, to autistics with severe impairments, So yeah, there have been debates on the appropriateness of applying neurodiversity ideas, a particular rejection of cure and prevention to autistics with severe impairments. For example, Simon Baron Cohen argues for splitting autism into those components to which neurodiversity approach should be applied and those for which traditional medical model is more appropriate. So again, yeah, this comes back down to what I was saying earlier about the biomedic the biopsychosocial synthesis, um, you know, where it's reductionistic and overly simplistic to just look at the social model in isolation or to just look at the medical model in isolation and that depending on the individual concerned, um, you know, different approaches will be needed and you should really very take, you should really take a, an individual, a very individualised approach instead of just assuming that someone would prefer one way over the other. You should be assuming that every autistic person is against treatment. It should very much be a very individual decision, choice. And people should have that choice. If, if, if research shows that there are certain interventions available that really do make a person's life better, then, you know, people should be allowed to pursue that. There is no scientific basis for segmenting in... Yeah, the, art, this is, the article then goes on to say, and this is just for the views of the article, obviously this is controversial, they say there is no scientific basis for, segment, for segmenting autism in a way proponents of a separate severe autism label suggest. Now that is obviously controversial. Um, I'd argue that we do need subgroups. Um, I, I'm not sure how that's best done. I know that some people have argued maybe we need like a profound autism group for those who have severe autism traits plus um, severe language delays um, and severe intellectual disability. Then maybe there should be a found group for them. I don't know, okay? I don't know myself. Um, I'm kind of on the, on the fence there a little bit, but I do, in terms of what I think about a profound autism category, but I do certainly think that we do need some way of segmenting what has become increasingly varied. I mean, yes, yes, there is a spectrum. Yes, we all know that, no two autistic people are the same, but it's now such a vast spectrum that it really doesn't mean much now. Just the, late, just the term autism doesn't really mean anything. Um... So I do feel, yeah, we need some way of segmenting that. And uh, as I said in that other article, you know, there's no such, there's no one cause of autism. You know, there are, there are different causes, different, is, is it, you know, we're actually talking arguably about actually different disorders that just so happen to all be called autism, just because they share similar features. Now, that's a debate for another time. Um, so the article goes on to suggest a further contribution to help make the case for neurodiversity's broad applicability. Rather than debate which populations neurodiversity should be applied to, 
it is argued that neurodiversity is best understood as applying to individual traits. That's an interesting approach. So, for example, the efforts to suppress hand flapping or demand eye contact are unacceptable. And I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, you know, no one should feel they need to make eye contact. You know, that is something that... That's where the social model maybe does apply, you know. Like, um, some people just find eye contact really uncomfortable. Personally, I find eye contact very uncomfortable. I can't look at someone's eyes and try and take in what they're saying at the same time. I can make eye contact sometimes, but it has to be on my terms. And um, I'm not someone who makes a lot of eye contact, so some people might interpret that the wrong way if I'm not looking at them. But, you know, I do actually find it a lot easier not to be always looking in their eyes. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that should be allowed and tolerated and respected, you know. People shouldn't be um, told off for that. And the same for, like, hand flapping. That's perfectly harmless. Um, it's a kind of regulatory thing and autistic children shouldn't be or adults shouldn't be stopped for hand shouldn't be told not to hand flap um because they're not intrinsically harmful uh but yeah the article says in contrast self-injury are appropriate targets of intervention obviously i'd agree i don't think anyone would disagree with that you know someone's engaging in self-injury and obviously they need some way of not doing that or like redirecting their self-regulatory behavior so that is not dangerous um, so here, harms are not the result of stigma, but they would emerge regardless of the social norms. So both models, it argues, the neurodiversity model, basically just call that the social model, and the medical might have application in the same person. Well, yeah, I'd agree. So, like, obviously, yeah, in my case, you know, eye contact, that'll come down to the social model. No one should force me to make eye contact. I think that does not need fixing. Um, I should be able to rock, you know, if I want to. And uh, people shouldn't stop me doing that if, that if I need to do that in order to listen to them or whatever. Um, but, you know, I might need... So, yeah, that comes down to the social model. Um, other parts of... See, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, it should be taken on a very individual basis, shouldn't it? And um, I think where the social model gets it wrong is this idea that you can you can allow someone to do all of those things and somehow they'll no longer be disabled. I mean, yes, you should allow those people to do things that aren't harming them or anyone else. And, um, you know, not expect them to make eye contact and all of that, and because that's ableist, and not to, you know, that's, that's the progressive side of the social model. Um, but, well, yeah, where the social model gets it wrong is this idea that... Um, that will just take that, that, that doing all that, that, allowing them not to make eye contact, allowing them to flap and all of those things will mean that they're no longer disabled, because of course they still are disabled. Um, you know, the very fact, you know, because there are other parts to, of being autistic that can be really, really like disabling, irrespective of um, how accommodating society is. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the article goes on to say that it's possible to address intrinsically harmful traits while also rejecting clinical passing demands. So clinical passing demands would be things like eye contact. It seems to be quite a balanced position, but unfortunately, um, you know, some very hardcore neurodiversity activists do preach this extreme social model, which doesn't, which basically argues that you provide everything a person needs and then they're no longer disabled. <laughs> it's that extreme approach which is really giving, which is which is why I've ended, ended up so critical of the neurodiversity movement. I wouldn't be critical of them in the way I am if, um, you know, they had this more balanced approach and, un, and understanding, you know, that some people, the medical model does apply and that also can be innately impairing and disabling regardless of what society you're in. Uh, and indeed, some people in the neurodiversity movement do take that middle ground. Remember, it's not it's not one movement, there's no leader. So you're going to find different interpretations of the paradigm, which is why it gets very confusing. Unfortunately, however, this the voice that says it isn't that awesome isn't a disability. Some even argue it's not a disability full stop, regardless of the social model. This voice, unfortunately, is very strong. And it does seem to be influencing... Um, wider society like i've noticed this a lot um you know like certain organizations are now going on about oh we must celebrate autism and you know it's not a disability and it's um we shouldn't see it as a disorder and it's just different and different is great um so yeah unfortunately this very hardcore aspect of the neurodiversity movement or interpretation of, of the paradigm um 
seeing autism as just a difference, not a disability. Unfortunately, that does seem to be gaining a lot of traction in um, certain uh, organisations, which is very worrying. Okay, so let me know what you think, and now I'm going to move over now to video number two, because I just want to go through some of your comments. I'm not going to be able to go through all of your comments today, so I'll just have to spread it out in the video. So I'm, I'm only going to be able to cover a couple of your comments today. So moving over to video number two now.